the brain operates on three levels. You have the reptilian brain, which is your survival level, and we share that brain with a reptile. On our reptilian level at the brain stem, there's no difference between us and a lizard, oh, yeah. us and a snake. Oh, yeah. On that level, all we understand is two things, attraction and repulsion. Yeah. We either drawn towards something or we're drawn away from it. We measure everything by whether or not it will sustain my life or take my life. And that's how animals in the jungle respond. They respond to you on, is this something I can eat? Is this something I can mate with? Is this something that will provide me shelter? Is this something that's threatening to take me out? In the so-called ghetto, that's what life is. It's survival. There's nothing creative going on. We're always seeking food, shelter, clothing, mating. We measure everybody, <coughs> pardon me, by whether or not that person is going to facilitate my life or take my life. Well, when the survival mechanism of the brain is on alert, the creative mechanism is shut down. Now, I, how can I prove that to you very quickly? Let's look at the most important nutrient in the third world, in the, in the third dimension. Of the three things we require to sustain this organism, which of those is the most important? Is it food? Food is crucial. But we need very little food That's right. That's right. to survive. It's actually scary. Right. How little food we require. The orchid, most exquisite flower on the earth, has eats no food. I'm gonna tell you in one second what it what it grows and evolves from. Most expensive, exquisite flower. Food is important, but we can go days, yeah. weeks, right. even months. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Proof of that is. The first year of life, where we experience the greatest growth that we will ever know, from zero to one, is when we eat the least food. All we need in those first 12 months is our mother's breast milk and nothing else. And not much of that. The next thing, which is more important than food, and we know that because of the time without which we can survive without it. Come on. We can go months without food. How long can we go without water? We can't go months without water. That's right. We can go days and we will be dehydrated. That's right. And when you get into serious dehydration, you really never recover from it. That's right. Even if you survive it, you're never the same. It actually, dehydration destroys brain cells. That's right. That's right. So people who are severely dehydrated, even though they come out of it, they never really think or speak the same way because of the loss of water. Because the brain is 75% water. We're 75% water. So we can't go long without it. But here's the most important thing. How long, and we give the least thought to this. How long can we live without air? Thank you. That's right. Thank you. How long? Now look, a minute, maybe two. For most of us, is safe. now. How do we know this is critical? God created us to react to threats in proportion to the degree of that threat. If you find out that we're not having dinner today. Now we're gonna be, somebody like me will be a quite turd. It would bother me, I think about it certainly. But could I make it to tomorrow? Am I gonna start running, am I gonna throw the podium down and start kicking and screaming? I might mumble and murmur, but it's okay. You're thirsty and there's no water. That's, that's a little bit more concern. Thirst is actually more disturbing than hunger. That's right. When you're hungry, you can say, oh, I'm hungry, but I'll wait. It's, dinner's not ready yet. I'll wait. 
But you go and say, well, can I have some water while I'm waiting? Right. When you're thirsty, you feel more compelled to go and do something about it. Because being thirsty has more of an effect on what you're doing. It's hard to think and function when you have thirst. What happens when your air supply gets shut off? What happens if you're on a plane and all the air is shut down in the cabin? What happens if you're laying in your bed and somebody puts a pillow over your nose and mouth? Somebody comes up behind you and covers your nose and mouth. You go out swimming and you're underwater and you can't get up. And can't. You absolutely fall apart. Right, right, right. Somebody cut off your air supply, you will tear this room up. That's right. right. Trying to get air. The most dangerous thing you can do is try to save a drowning victim. Yes, yes, because they are in such a state of panic right. that they will pull you down under. And in many cases, you see in the news, somebody went in to save a person and that person survived and the one that went to save them drowned. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because we need air. And we live in so-called ghettos and we eat food and we use unhealthy products and we live in places where there's lead and asbestos and we don't go outdoors. We sit in front of big, wide, flat screen televisions and watch cribs and the lifestyles of the rich and famous and pretend we're Beyonce or Prince and live in a daggone fantasy world. And while we watch it on television, the white man lives it. While we're out at Christmas spending every dime we earn and every dime we have yet to earn. Buying cheap toys and cheap clothes that'll be tore up by February. Right. Right. And the people selling us that stuff do not believe in Jesus. Right. Hey. Hey. They reject Jesus. That's right. And while you in there spending money that's going into trust funds for their offspring. Hey. They're down on the beaches in Barbados, hey. in Aruba, hey. and St. Croix, and St. Thomas in the Bahamas experiencing the sun of the land of the black man while we run around in the cold in the snow trying to buy some cheap, stupid computer game. Come on. Hey. Hey. That's right. Hey. Hey. So this is why teaching separation is more important than teaching. Hey. Hey. So in repair, mm. the body fixes itself to the extent that the wound is no longer a threat. The area can function to a degree, but it no longer looks or functions the way it originally did. So we got a big scar, we got keloid, the hand doesn't move like it used to, but we're alive. That's right. That's repair. Repair leaves scarring. So now the white man comes up with welfare systems and prefab houses That's right. and a car for us to drive and a TV for us to look at and a Game Boy or in a, in a, uh, some cell phones come on, come on, come on. and voicemail and caller ID so we can lay up, don't run up any calls for who's calling <laughs> But if the phone ring in the Oval Office, the president pick it up. <laughs> I've been in the office with Minister Farrakhan so many hours you can't count. Phone ring, pick up the phone, yes. <laughs> you know, people that, that have something and are doing something, what are you afraid of? Who, who, who that? Who that know? <laughs> I don't know him. <laughs> Tell them I ain't here. Your brother and sister call you, leave you a message, you won't return the call. Come on, man. Come on. How can you look at a number from somebody you know and you won't call them back? I know what they want. 
See, that's not a person. That's a reptile. That's measured everything in attraction and repulsion. We take every technology this white man makes and misuse it. I emailed you. <laughs> See, what happened to relationships? I can't talk to you in an email. Email is for quick messages, like a confirmation or something we've discussed. You don't live in the email. But we want to avoid looking people in the eye. And we're liars. That's why we won't answer the phone, because we're liars. Because we told the white man, give me the car and I'll pay you. We're like Wimpy in the Popeye cartoon. Give me a hamburger today, I'll pay you Tuesday. Give me, give me that Lexus today and I'll pay you next month. Don't have two dimes to rub together. Live in Lexus. <laughs> then the white man have his woman call you about the payment. Go ahead. And you won't even answer the phone. But you riding around in Lexus. How you doing? <laughs> this is insanity. Ooh.